and welcome to our third SOMA webinar on magic science and society. And thank you for joining us today. So our theme today is advancing magic through science. And we will try to answer questions such as how can scientists and the scientific methods advance our understanding of magic? Or what are the limits of this approach to magic? So I'm excited to moderate today's panel. We have a great lineup of speakers uh, and we will discuss this subject together. Our panelists today are first Joshua Jay, who is an internationally renowned magician, author and lecturer. He has performed in more than 100 countries, holds a Guinness World Record for card tricks and was named Magician of the Year by the Society of American Magicians in 2020 for his contributions to the arts of magic. He is also the author of three books for the public and four books for magicians and has helped design an influential study on magic in partnership with the College of New Jersey. Then we also have Dr. Gustav Kuhn, who is a reader in psychology at Goldsmiths University of London, where he directs the MAGIC Lab. So MAGIC Lab stands for Mind, Attention and General Illusory Recognition. And the MAGIC Lab studies human behavior and cognition using magic to study a wide range of psychological questions around consciousness, attention, perception, deception, or even free will. Gustav is one of the pioneering researchers in the science of magic, and he is also one of the founding members and presidents of the Science of Magic Association. His latest book is called Experiencing the Impossible, the Science of Magic, where he discusses how the scientific study of magic reveals intriguing insights into the mysteries of the human mind. We also have Dr. Andy Luttrell, who is an assistant professor of psychological science at Ball State University. He studies the psychology of influence, persuasion, and opinion. His uh, interest in magic goes back to his childhood. He worked at a magic shop for several years as a teenager, performed regularly around the Chicago land area, and even published the occasional effect in various magic magazines. In 2015, he released the book Psychology for the Mentalists after spending years in graduate school learning the actual psychology that mentalists have often pretended to know. Finally, Last but not least, Roberto Giobi is an award-winning and internationally famous magician, renowned for his many contributions in teaching card magic. Roberto has a mathematical and scientific background, and since 1988, he has been working as a professional magician, author, and lecturer. His five best-selling card college volumes are the most widely translated magic books in history and are considered worldwide as the ultimate reference work for card magic. So thanks to all of you for being with us today. I'm very excited to hear your thoughts on the subject. And without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Joshua. All right, well, thank you, Alice. Thank you, Gustav, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm going to spend the next six or eight minutes telling you about my journey to this topic. And it really came about because magicians are a very interesting group. Um, they are all self-proclaimed experts, it seems. And there are so many times that magicians say, well, we know that people are more drawn to red cards than black cards. Or we know that you have to start with your opening trick has to be something quick. Or people hate magicians who are funny or, or, or these sweeping statements. And my question was, how do we know that? How do we know that that's true? What are you basing that on? And magicians had no real scientific background. They had no real basis or baseline to go from. So I found myself at the College of New Jersey. I was hired to do a talk for the psychology department and I did my show and all of a sudden hands started going up. And, well, can you tell us the science behind why that's it? And I realized I didn't know, but that nobody knew those things. So afterward, uh, I talked with the, the dean of that school of psychology and, and several others, and we decided to uh, design a study that would try to answer some of those questions. And I published this study in 20, 
12, I believe. Um, and it's been very helpful for me and it's helped, I think, the way a lot of magicians approach magic. So now let me take you through some of the things that we looked at. So for one thing, a shocking revelation that came to us was the importance of an introduction. So if you're not a magician, you may not think about such a thing, but before you're introduced, like Alice told you a little bit about each of our histories, and maybe you raised your eyebrows at, at some of the great accolades of my fellow panelists. But what does it mean to be introduced as a magician? Does that affect the show? Well, what we found was when we showed the same magician, same magic clip to a group of different groups of people, the results were staggeringly different depending on how the people were framed. For example, if we said, please watch magician Joshua Jay, who was a former world champion of magic, do a routine in which he fooled the greatest judges in magic. Then they see the same performance as somebody who just says, look at Joshua Jay and this trick. And we would show that, for, we would test for peer review, like this is a magician's magician. This is the most expensive magician in the world. This magician is famous. He's appeared on television many times. And what we found is it, it really didn't matter what the introduction was. In other words, some people responded better to peer review. Some people responded better to accolades. But some kind of introduction versus no introduction made the audience score the magician 50% higher and often meant that they were more fooled. Now, how can this be? Well, what we surmised, and it requires further study certainly, is that at a certain point, if you feel like you're watching an expert, the same way that you might feel if you know you're seeing a doctor who really knows his stuff or her stuff, then perhaps we let down our guard and we don't try to burn the magician as much as possible and try to figure it out. So I thought that that was sort of interesting. We also had really unusual things. One of my favorite little wrinkles in the study was we wanted to test memory, recall of magic tricks, because wouldn't that be interesting to know for magicians what sorts of things stuck in a spectator's mind. So we would show a sequence of tricks and then ask people to recall those tricks one hour after, one week, uh, one month, and six months later. And what we found is, is very closely related to uh, many other studies on memory, which is the last thing that they saw was the stickiest, the easiest thing to recall. The first thing that they saw was the second most sticky thing. Openers and closers that I think magicians can track that as well. The stuff in the middle was the hardest to recall. But here's, here's the wrinkle that really upset me. It turns out that people will recall a, a magic trick in great detail. I signed my name on a banknote and it ended up inside a lemon. The guy took a sword and pushed it through a woman's neck and pulled it out and she was fine. Very specific recall on tricks. But when it came to card tricks, my chosen craft, the thing I spend more time on than anything, people just said, and card tricks. People weren't distinguishing between finding four aces and shuffling face up and face down and straightening them out and having a signed card appear on the top of the deck. To them, it was all card tricks. So for a time we thought, oh, well, I guess that that means that people just don't differentiate from one card trick to another. But when we crunched the data a little more, we found a really interesting aberration. And that is when another object was involved, the memory was very specific. A card ended up in an orange, the orange. He sprung the cards at the window and it went through the other side of the window, the window. He had me pick a card and it ended up in my necklace, the necklace. If you can pair a card trick with another object that helps in the memory of it, which was a really useful thing to share with magicians. So the last part of the study is really the core of the study, the centerpiece. And that's the one last thing that I'll leave you with. And that is we asked people, a thousand people, what they like best and least about magic. And it turns out that what magicians have thought for centuries is entirely wrong on both accounts. I thought for sure that what people would like most about magic would be not knowing how it's done or trying to figure out how it's done. These things scored less than 5%. I thought maybe they would say the humor because a lot of magicians are funny. Again, just marginally uh, on the radar. It turns out that 
a significant amount of people who watch magic, they don't like the mystery the best. They don't recall the trick. It's not the show. It's not the spectacle. What they like most about magic is surprise. Surprise. They like the idea of not knowing what's coming next. And this was said in each person's different way, but when we categorized it among 25 or so categories, this was the overwhelmingly uh, largest scoring thing. And this really, I believe, not to overstate the case, changes the way that I view magic. I had to look at my show and completely reconstruct it from the ground up because I wanted to make sure that my show was packed with as much surprise as it was packed with anything else. Um, hi, Alice. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Josh, for this great kind of like basis for the science of magic. Now, uh, as a teenager, I was completely obsessed about magic and I spent pretty much most spare minute of my life just practicing sleight of hand, shuffling cards and annoying most of my friends. But at the time I quickly realized that I needed to learn other skills as well to broaden my performance arts. So I took on jazz dancing classes because I felt well, it was important to learn how to learn to, to move to music. And that was a complete waste of time. And <laughs> Anybody who's seen me move will know that I really didn't take anything away from that. Um, I learned mime. Um, I took mime classes. Um, and I met a lot of really interesting people through that. But again, it didn't really didn't help me that much with my art form. But even back then, I knew that psychology was really important. And so I read lots of psychology books, mostly on body language, because I wanted to try and find the sort of like the magic bullets that would help me read people's minds. Now, many of these principles didn't work that well, but it did inspire me to go and study psychology at university later. Now, I've now spent the last 20 years or more studying the psychology of magic and I've been particularly using magic as a way of trying to uncover some of the mysteries of the human mind and along this path I've realized that there's a lot of ways in which this study of magic can help magicians improve their art form and I think there's two main categories and I think Josh and again anybody who hasn't read Josh study I highly recommend you read this because it gives you so much insight into what people truly think about magic but I'd like to give you a bit of a broader overview of the two areas where I think the scientific method or the scientific approach can truly advance the art of magic first of all I think science can provide us with much more objective evidence about how your tricks actually work so how do you know whether your trick is any good or not? Now, as magicians, we typically rely on informal observations. Uh, such as, for example, we perform a magic trick and then we look at how people react to this. But if you really want to know what your audience thinks about your magic, you need to find a way of stepping inside your spectator's mind. Now, psychologists, they've spent more than a century or more developing lots of different tools that help them understand how people and what people think. And I believe that some of these tools can help us understand what people truly think about the tricks and how they work. Because just because we've done things in a certain way in the past doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way of doing so. And Josh has already alluded to some of these. And the same is true throughout history in lots of other domains. So doctors for years used to think that you could, because sort of like that bloodletting would help certain mental, mental disorders. Well, they did it for years and years and thought that was the right way of doing it. And it's only once we actually understand some of the mechanisms, some of the biology behind it, that we know that that doesn't actually work. Now, in the magic lab, we've been studying some of these common cycle, common conjuring principles, and I think some of the results have been truly surprising. Now, we're mostly cognitive psychologists, so a lot of our work has looked at rather specific mechanisms, so specific principles. So, for example, Alice has done some great work on the crisscross force, so all the cross-cut force that most of you well, no. Now, I was always taught that to perform this force, you need to use misdirection and you need a bit of a time delay. And that's what magicians all across the globe have been doing for years and years. 
but by studying the and by, by studying this force scientifically and asking people, well, how do you, what are you really seeing? How are you really feeling about this force card? We've learned that you don't need any misdirection. This principle is incredibly profit, is incredibly power, powerful. It works just as well if you use misdirection, if you or if you don't use misdirection. Now, the only way that we can come to these findings is through experimentation and genuinely asking people questions. Alice has done some great work on the magician's choice or equivocate. Um, so there again, I was always told that it's very important that if you've got the consistent path of questioning that that's probably the best way of doing it. It turns out it doesn't matter. In actual fact, having inconsistencies in these pathways can actually sometimes lead people to feel freer in their choices. I've done lots of work on misdirection and our intuition about how misdirection works and just about how much we truly perceive is very wrong. Like it's very hard for us to imagine just how little people experience. Now, as magicians, we often can't ask difficult questions. Like you can't ask a question without necessarily giving away the secret of your trick or ruining the whole routine. As psychologists and the scientists, we can do so. And I think kind of like by asking some of these important questions, we can gain unique insights into sort of like what people truly think about your magic. The second, so, 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 so I think science can provide, give us tools to understand how people really experience your magic. I think the other main area where science can help is because I think particularly science as a psychology and neuroscience, provides us with a blueprint of the human brain. Now, psychologists have spent a lot of years studying how the brain works, and we've learned a lot about many of these processes. We know a lot about perception, about attention, how memory is formed, how memory is distorted, and even about how we reason and the kind of decisions that we make. Now, as magicians, our main objective is to manipulate people's conscious experiences. And to do so, we use a wide range of psychological tricks. And I think magicians have got a very good understanding of which of these principles work, but they don't necessarily know why they work. And I think science offers a blueprint of the human mind, or like you can think of this like an instructional manual. And I think this manual can help us create much more powerful tricks. So, I mean, I recently, I've just moved house and my washing machine was broken. I spent about two hours trying to fix the washing machine. And I was stuffed, I had no idea what I was doing. And I had to call up an engineer, he came around, took him five minutes to run some diagnostics and he could fix it. But the main difference between me and the engineer is that the engineer knows how washing machines works. And like that, once you've got that knowledge, once you've got that blueprint, it's a lot easier to fix things. And I think the same is true for magic. Um, so once you understand some of these limitations, uh, once you understand how the human brain tries to make sense of things, that can give you a powerful tool to create much more powerful magic. And I know, like, for example, Tom Stone has used a lot of these principles in his misdirection by exploiting some of the specific limitations of human perception to create truly astonishing effects. So to stop my ramble here, uh, in terms of it's gone off for me, the kind of like the main contributions that science can provide is for what on one hand, there's these tools that we can use to evaluate your magic and evaluate what people really think about your magic. And on the other hand, it's this indirect knowledge. So there's knowledge about how the human brain works that hopefully you'll be able to use to create more powerful effects. Thank you, Gustav. It's great to hear your view as a researcher after just view as a performer. And I have to admit, I have been very surprised that many of our results uh, on the science of magic or experiments. Let's hear from Dr. Lutfall. Uh, Okie doke. Uh, so hello, everyone. This is very uh, fun and exciting and uh, different from the, <laughs> the kind of work that I'm, I'm usually doing. Um, I, I think I'm here probably mostly because I wrote this book, Psychology for the Mentalist. Um, and, and one of the things that's different about this than some of the work that we've been talking about so far is that I don't cover research on magic specifically, and, and I don't myself do that research on magic specifically. I'm interested in social psychology as a, a field of understanding how people operate in their social um, situations, which is what an audience member does 
when they're in the midst of a magic performance. And so I was interested in saying like, what, what do we already know from, you know, a hundred years of social science research that is applicable to the kind of work that we do? Um, but I'm also here as a psychological scientist to put on a little bit of a skeptical hat as well. So, you know, Joshua earlier was saying that uh, magicians have long claimed to know certain things to be true without having any real evidence for it. I'm here as a scientist also to say that even when we have evidence for something, we should be cautious about claiming we know stuff <laughs> with certainty, at least in the way we we want to say we know something. Um, and, and kind of the point that I want to make is that when we do research in the social sciences, we're using statistics. W without statistical analysis, we don't have the findings that we have. But statistics at its heart is a method of explaining variance, right? And, and variance is just this bug of the world we live in that we have to deal with. And so by, by variance, I mean like, you know, let's think about our personalities, right? Everyone on this call varies in their own personality and quirks about themselves. And what we want to do as researchers is to explain that variance, right? If I can sort of find, okay, people are all over the map in terms of their personality. Can I isolate some of the factors that explain why some people are more extroverted than others, for example? Um, but there's always gonna be variance left over. And we're in the business of trying to isolate tendencies, but we have to be cautious to treat them as uniform laws of the world. Um, so if we think about the example of memory for a certain performance, people will vary, right? You can do everything you can do to make people remember your performance. Some people are going to remember every step you took. Some people, even when you have an object in your card trick, will have no idea what you did when you ask them a week later. And that's fine. That doesn't undermine the reality that having an object in the trick improves memory, but it means that, that you don't want to bank on it as sort of the, the perfect solution to, to wanting people to remember things. So I take an approach that if you've read, um, there's an influential book about 10 or so years ago called Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. These are behavioral economists who, who are, are, were interested in like, how do we improve policy in especially the United States? Like, how do we get people to sign up for insurance? How do we get people to make better choices for themselves? We can't force people to do certain things, um, but we can nudge them to do certain things, right? And the, their book is called Nudge. This principle is called Nudge. And I think that that's a really nice way of thinking about the ways we could use psychological science in the performing arts, right? To use them as nudges. Um, and so the implications of this uh, can apply to, to three different outcomes. One is in terms of the methodology. Um, in some ways, the, the impetus for this book on mentalism and psychology specifically is there's just this appetite for using pure psychological methods to accomplish stuff. And listen, if, if somehow you have cracked the code and you can do it perfectly every time, I'm super impressed. Um, but because of the reality of statistical variance, even the most well-supported psychological finding is not going to be a tool that you can lean on. Um, and so I think this, this approach of nudges um, makes, makes me cautious about leaning on them as methods per se. But where I think these nudges shine is in audience management and effect enhancers, right? So if we think about audience management, there's a ton of research in psychological science on compliance with requests, with rapport, with forming relationships, with communication. These are all ways in which you can maximize the flow of your performance because part of what we're doing is, is working directly with other people and people are, are they vary and, and we wanna do as much as we can to get some control on it. And I think the tools that we have in psychology can do that. And the other is as effect enhancers, which I think is really, Banachek's psychological subtleties was really about this, right? It wasn't about using psychology as methods. It was being able to nudge people to have a better experience with a performance um, than they would have otherwise, right? So we can create opportunities to cement people's memories or to, to redirect people's memories. Um, and we think of those not as methods to accomplish the trick itself. Right? The, I was trying to think of a metaphor for this earlier today. And I was thinking I have this, a minor obsession with baking bread. And you can think about like the, the secret to the trick as the yeast, right? It, it's not going to be bread if there's no yeast involved, but you can incorporate more gluten into your bread dough to make that dough more um, expansive, to hold together better. 
right? You, you can't forego the critical ingredient, but you can maximize your outcomes by leaning on stuff that's naturally relevant. And so the final thing that I want to say about that is that, you know, although it's great that we have all these data on specifically people's reactions to magic as it occurs, right? How do we specifically know when this force is going to pay off uh, the biggest? People have been doing social science research for a long time, and almost all of it has nothing to do specifically with magic, but it's it's all relevant, right? And so it's worth exploring these topics. And here's where I'll quickly plug uh, a podcast that I do called Opinion Science, which is um, sort of taking the insights from persuasion and influence and forming attitudes toward things. And these are basic principles, and you can think of ways to apply them uh, in your own work, right? Just like a marketing agency wants to know exactly the perfect method to, to advertise their product, that study is not going to exist, right? But you can draw upon the research we have to form a hypothesis about what's going to work for you. And, and that's the final note, which is that we're doing science and science is hypothesis driven and not all hypotheses turn out to be correct. We test things all the time that turn out not to be true, or at least probably are not true. And so, yes, you can take these insights from science to enhance a magic performance, um, but, but the specific way you do that is ultimately a hypothesis that you will need to test in your own work before knowing if all the variables are in place to get the effect that you want. So just a few thoughts from, from the behind the scenes uh, perspective of where the science itself comes from and what that means for the limits and opportunities to, to use it in what you wanna use it for. Very much. I really like your link with nudges. I can clearly see direct links with forcing techniques. I really recommend the nudge book as well for anyone interested in psychology or any magicians. And I think you've touched upon some important limitations in uh, the scientific method as well. So maybe we'll have time to discuss that a bit more later. So before we move on to the q and I'll leave it to you, Roberto. Good evening, everyone. So Alice and Gustav suggested that I should uh, speak a little bit about uh, how I use psychology and psychological principles in my work as a performing magician. Now, I thought that maybe you, you might be interested to know how I got in touch with psychology in the first place, because that's not the first thing you learn when you start to be enthusiastic about magic. And I think I could date it. It's, it was in 1978 I met Juan Tamarez, who should be familiar, everyone with him, maybe arguably the most influential magician of our time. And he was the first to suggest that uh, I read not only magic books, but also books uh, that are related to other topics, especially in psychology. So that's uh, what I started to do. And that was about at the age of 19, I had started magic uh, at the age of 14. And so I, I, I did magic, practice magic for about five years because before I started to um, have doors and windows open to me into other realms that play an important part in the magic effect. And uh, so that started to do and I was reading at that time about one magic book a week or maybe more and also at least one non-magic book a month or more. So uh, Although some of them were in my, I borrowed them from a public library, I have always been a fan of books, so I bought a lot, but you had the advantage that now I could go down to my other library. You, you see in the back, you see a little bit of my magic library here, which is about 3,500 books in, in 17 languages. I collect also a few, which I don't understand. And in the downstairs library, I counted them over 500 books which have nothing to do with magic, but which influenced my vision and my practice and my study and also my writings in, in magic. And uh, well, these was, they're all books or most of them are books which you would, you people who are expert scientists, professional scientists, class, popular sciences. So I made a few notes. Uh, I think maybe the, the first uh, book uh, I read possibly was Desmond Morris, Man Watching that uh, is about, about body language. And that of course opened an important part of, uh, of communication and communication is a, a superordinate uh, concept of, of body language and there are other. So I started to 
look for more books into that. Another book I found at a relatively early age, David Taylor, Mind, uh, I'm in 1983, I, I put sehr gut in German, very good. So I started, of course, to uh, research into everything that has to do uh, with the mind and with thinking. And I got in, in books of psych classic psychologists. So from, from Jung, of course, which was Carl Gustav Jung, very important, not just because he's Swiss like me, but because the, the symbols are a very important part of uh, the magic effect, you know, that the emotion we are touching uh, when we perform a magic trick, because we're going very deep into, into all these symbols that Jung has formulated very nicely uh, in a language that even I could understand. Then I got uh, a lot into psychoanalyst and the June singer. I remember Bruno Bettelheim and all these people later NLP, which has a nice uh, terminology, which is very useful. Um, but also books, you know, of Frederick Vester, I have uh, noted here because that was the first book I read about memory, you know, ultra short time memory, short time memory, long time memory. That was a great influence in looking how information that is given during a magic performance is transported into the uh, spectator's mind, how it is stored and how it can be, you know, changed or deleted or added and then brought back at the opportune moment. And of course, it's very important when the spectator reconstructs the effect, uh, because it's not just at the moment of the astonishment that uh, the, the spectator uses his, his memory. It's also when he relives the trick or retells the trick. And that has also to do with, of course, with, with memory. Um, I also made notes about Batsl Paul Watzlawick and Edward de Bona and all this thing. And one was very important, uh, Gombrich, Art and Delusion. That sort of the uh, sacred trinity in, in the in the in the in, in magic for me, you know, that you you have the the natural sciences and you have the humanities and you have the arts. And what's fascinating about psychology is that it doesn't belong to any of them, but studies all of them. So uh, that was automatic, also a, a link to to, psych, to psychology. I had two uh, experiences which um, I found interesting, and which made me think, one was Paul Watzlawick. Paul Watzlawick did a lecture here in Basel, where I live in Switzerland. So I went to see the lecture and afterwards I took up all my courage and I saw a uh, professor Watzlawick, uh, I am, I'm a magician man. They would say, oh, he was very enthusiastic. And he said, I, I like magic and, and started to speak a little bit. And they say, oh, I'm just coming back from Vienna where I saw uh, uh, a memory artist, you know, that, uh, memory is yours you know, these people performing uh, these memory feet, uh, rapid calculators and things in, in, in that uh, area. Uh, they use, of course, a lot of tricks also. I mean, it's a lot, is, a lot of practice and memory, granted, but a lot of tricks. And he said, and you know, the thing was, he had to concentrate every time before he announced the result. Without that concentration, it would not have been possible. And I said, well, Professor, this is, uh, you know, this is just what we call staging, it's showmanship. Uh, of course, there was a trick. Oh, no, no, he didn't use any tricks. This was the real thing. And that made me think because I said, how can such a highly educated person be so naive and, uh, and ignorant about uh, how this, these things really work, at least this one. And another thing, which I found interesting was uh, it came about the same time I gave a lecture in uh, Lisbon about magic. And after the lecture, the daughter of a magic friend who had just finished her studies in psychology came up to me and said, Roberto, you know, in these two hours of your lecture, I learned more about psychology than in the three months of practicum I had to do in my studies right now. Now, that was the first time I thought about that there might be a difference between uh, you know, the experimental, the scientific study of magic and the application of scientific principle in the real life of a magician. In any case, uh, by when I, when I started to, to use, I mean, this, this, this came with time. It, it can't tell you if it was a specific moment, 
you have to start to uh, wonder what is what is the, what is magic about? What is the essence of magic? And the way to try to to uh, to to grasp the <laughs> what is so difficult to grasp is to find a definition for the dictionary. So so I, if you had time, I would challenge every, every one of you to give me a definition. Magic is or conjuring is for the dictionary. And I don't mean a three three page essay for the Encyclopedia Britannica. Several people could do that probably quite well, but the one sentence, one sentence uh, definition. So uh, uh, it took me a long time to come up uh, and I made a, up a collection. First, I started to collect definitions. And in my books, uh, Secret Agenda and Hidden Agenda, I have where I devote one day to some, I, well, one day a year to some concept of magic. One is devoted to my collection of definitions of magic. And like the definitions are about art, there are so many that you wonder, does anybody understand what it is? So uh, uh, my definition is magic is the performing art of wonder. Magic is the performing art of wonder. Uh, it can be expanded in a secondary clause by saying based on complex principles from the natural sciences, the humanities and the arts, maybe, but the important thing. So the question is, uh, when studying psychology as a magician or when I teach or when I write is the first question is what is the effect or where does the effect take place? You know, to understand that. So let me make an example. If let's say you've selected the card, which might be the four of hearts. Hope you can see that. Otherwise you can believe me. And, and let's assume that the, the card is lost in the pack, right? So by shuffling and cutting, that's supposed to lose a card, right? So it's, it's any one of these 52 cards. And I say, I'm going to make your card come to the top. So I just go like this and look, this is uh, the king of clubs. And you will say no, and I will say yes. And you will say no, and I will say yes. And, no, no, I mean, it's the king of clubs. Of course, it's not your card, but I'm going to just snap the finger and it changes into your card. Okay, so that's not your selection. Now the question is, where does the effect take place? I do this in my lectures. Um, Magicians, of course, or, or those who do magic, it's not the same thing, magician is, is, is a profession. Uh, they say, well, it, it's not when you show the king because that's just the initial situation. The magic is not when you do show the four because that's just a fall apart. And the magic is not in the double lift, which is just the method. The magic, of course, takes place in the mind of the spectator when he or she sees the four of hearts has to go back on the timeline and remember the initial situation. And then we'll try to find the causal relationship between the two. And the solution they are going for, well, he somehow had to switch the cards, but I watched, I listened. It was, everything was in my uh, field of vision. He did not do that. It was very clear, I even stayed in the same space. And at that moment, when the logical mind doesn't find the connection between the initial and the final situation, while the spectator loses his feet on the, of logic on the, under his feet and the ground of logic and falls into wonderland, right? So the emotion of we are looking for, as I said in the definition, is wonderment, is amazement, is, a, is astonishment. But before the spectator gets to that in his mind, he has to go through an intellectual process. And of course, the science that studies the intellectual process, which leads to the emotion, not of surprise, but of wonderment, uh, of astonishment, that is of course done to some degree uh, by psychology. And that's why uh, I have an interest and an affinity for psychology. They are. So I think I have got my, my six or whatever minutes they were. And uh, there's a lot to say <laughs> because it's a wonderful and very profound and deep and complex art. It's really nice to hear all these positive views on, on how psychology can help magic. Uh, so we'll move on to the Q&A. Um, I know that Josh has to leave us soon. So I'll start with a few questions because 
many people are interested in your studies um, and people are asking you, Josh, about uh, the surprise elements. How did you add surprise? Did you add sucker elements? And when you and could you elaborate on the surprise elements in that in that um, was that a sense of astonishment or unexpected outcome or improbable results? Yeah, uh, I saw that question in the chat, and there are a couple others that I, I would like to get to because I maybe I wasn't clear enough when um, when I spoke on those topics. But I want to be very careful because the way we designed that particular part of the study was was open-ended. So we didn't want to lead people, you know, what's your favorite part about watching Magician? Is it A, the mystery? Is it B, trying to figure it out? We wanted to have people give us truly when they just cleared their mind and thought about it, what it was they liked the best. So I can't really speak to what they meant because that's asking a thousand different people for a thousand interpretations. However, we know by the theme and the structural skeletal elements of a trick, certain tricks have surprises built in. Think about the classic cups and balls. Everybody watching this would know that trick. And there's a certain logic to the trick and there's a certain premise to the trick, right? Three balls, three cups typically that penetrate, that move around, that assemble. And then for no foreshadowing or seeming logic or reason at the end of the trick, historically, you lift up the cups and there are surprises there. They can be anything from live chicks to fruit to vegetables to beads to whatever so what is it about that moment that's both shocking and surprising and lack of logic and and what is it about that moment that's so appealing and i don't want to speak for any audience member i don't want my answers to ever transcend the experiment but i think what's important is the unexpected i think that and, and maybe this can get into one question that I wanted to address specifically, which is by Steven Zuckerman um, and transition into that, uh, which is that I don't ever want to put, put, put my theories on top of data. I can only tell you what the data is and what my opinion is. But Steven Zuckerman's asking, uh, says, seems like most of the speaker comments are theoretical considerations. Would like to hear practical applications of science to magic and vice versa. So my whole point was, you know, I've sp I spoke on stage with the authors of Slights of Mind um, a couple of times, and they wrote this book where they did some neuroscience studies of working with magicians. I didn't work with them much, but their conclusions were very broad. It was things like, we found that people's attentions are diminished when they're laughing. We find that a curving line in misdirection is better than a straight line. And, and I always thought to myself, like, interesting enough, but so vague that how are you going to use those applications in real settings? However, the things that I've presented, um, Stephen and everybody, are all rooted in very practical applications. So I didn't talk about some of them, but in this study, we asked people to think of a card. So what could be more useful than knowing the trends of a thousand people and which cards they think of most often, which ones they think of least often, and how you can tweak that by saying, I want you to think of a card to one group, but to another group, you say, I want you to think of a card, for example, the Ace of Spades or the Queen of Hearts, but not those. Well, by taking out the two most iconic and popular cards, how does that shift what people are going to say? So there are practical things like that, but everything in the study, I wanted to be able to make a measurable change in my show. So just the, the small part of the study I talked about, having an introduction. I mean, for a magician who didn't have an introduction to have an introduction, 50% better in many cases, just by making that tweak. Or rooting your card tricks with other props. That's a very tangible, practical application, I believe, because it's making your card trick more memorable. Or building a whole show with surprises in it. I can't think of anything that would change a show more, more concretely in a way that's guided by the science of psychology. Yes, thanks, Josh. I think there's many practical uh, ways to, to apply uh, this study. And, and again, you should all read that. Uh, I have to say all of you were quite positive on the science of magic. So I have to ask all of you, outside the fact that science has limits to its approach to magic. Do you see any harm that can be done with the scientific method uh, studying magic? I'm thinking 
about the exposure issue um, and for, for instance how we have to explain some tricks in, in publications and if you have any any other ideas I'd, I'd like to hear them yeah i mean i'm happy to <laughs> to answer some of these questions and particularly because i've got quite a lot of hate from certain magicians uh, about exposure um, I, I really don't think that, I mean, I, th I think as scientists, I think we have to be really careful and I think we have got a duty to make sure that when we do talk about our findings to the wider public or, I mean, when we write about them in publications, I don't think it matters that much because there's so few people who actually read these publications, but if we do give talks and make it available to the wider public, I think we do have, we, we do have a responsibility to not to rob people of the wonder that magic can elicit. And I think I would definitely also stay away from targeting specific tricks that certain individuals are actually performing. However, I don't think that talking about the psychology of magic, even if it does give away some broad principles such as misdirection, that does any harm on magic. And indeed, kind of like uh, we, we, we've just submitted a paper which examined the impact that, for example, the, the Smoke and Mirrors exhibition had. Now, the Smoke and Mirrors exhibition attracted quite a lot of negative feedback from some magicians, um, but our evaluation showed that actually attending this attending this exhibition and learning about the psychology behind magic increased people's appreciation for magic. Not only just it also increased the probability of them going to seek out to watch live magic and magic on television. So really rather than doing harm, I think a lot of the psychology of magic enhances people's appreciation for magic because they think of it as not just this is not just like a silly little trick or so there's something really interesting behind it. And I think if you look at some of the most some of the most popular magicians today, I mean, Penn and Teller, Darren Brown, they all deal with a certain bit of exposure or a certain bit of psychology behind it as well. And I think that increases people's appreciation for the art. I was gonna comment uh, just a bit on that. Um, I don't know if this is coming through. Thumbs up that you can hear me, okay. <laughs> um, the you know, an interesting distinction that that's come up is the distinction between science for science's sake versus science for magic's sake, um, and those are going to be two different enterprises, right? And so, the 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 notion that the conclusions that that would have wanted to be drawn from those uh, studies in uh, sleights of mind are, it makes sense because as a scientist, I go, I want to learn about people and and sort of how things work, and I don't really care as a scientist about a specific application. Um, and it would be it would be wonderful if there was something. I'm a big fan of America's Test Kitchen, who when they develop recipes, they do test after test, and they do taste tests, and they vary this and they vary that. And I would love. <laughs> to see a magic book come out where each effect comes with some explanation of all the variations that were tried and experimented with and how they arrived as sort of the max. I mean, implicit in a good magic book is that, right? Honed over performance, but, but to have it kind of laid out is like, we did the experiments for each of these effects, right? And the result is like a tested strategy. And there, all the secrets stay in the community, right? It's it's not you know these aren't being published in in a in a general publication, um, but it, but it just seems like these questions depend a lot on what the purpose of the science is. Um, so just just raising that thought. Yes, thank you. Um, it makes me think um, from a performance point of view, are there things that you would like to see uh, science and scientists investigate? or change in the way uh, they are currently studying magic? Um, I'll, I'll speak to that and then Roberto, if he has something to add, can, can come in as a fellow performer. Um, when, when I hear your question, I'm just encouraged because uh, thanks to Gustav and, and people like uh, yourself, Alice, like, there's now a forum to test these things. So for example, I, I came to you guys not so long ago and said, I have a question that I can't answer that I think science and, and studying it in a, in a laboratory can answer. And so we worked together on this new study. And I did the same with Matt Baker uh, at Georgia Tech who is watching this right now. So I'm engaged now with researchers 
on all sorts of interesting questions. So I would say to you that in the last 10 years, a new door has opened up that we can ask really essential questions. Like uh, I'll give a tease here, I won't give the results, but in one of the things that we looked at, we wanted to know an age old assumption in magic, which is magicians have always taken as gospel the idea that a named card is stronger than a picked card. So for those who may not be in magic, what I'm saying is if I say to you, pick a card, show it around, but don't show it to me and we'll put it in the deck and I'll try and find it. That's situation one. And situation two is I shuffle a deck and I say, think of a card in your head, one I couldn't possibly influence you on and now name it and I'm going to find it. Technically speaking, objectively, that's a more impressive thing because the magician can't control a card as well that's thought of as he can or she can that's, that's picked. However, it turns out that the results might surprise you about how laymen, when, when asked, feel about a picked versus thought of and named card. There's a lot more nuance. There's a lot more that goes into it. And that changes, fundamentally changes, the way a magician ought to look at how they structure their show. Roberto, would you like to see scientists investigate something in particular? Yeah, well, let me say, if, if maybe I can say something about this surprise subject we talked before that has to do with that, of course, because it all connects. Um, what I think that when people said in, in Josh's um, a re uh, te experiment or, or your result was, uh, that's the intuitive thing you think. You say, yeah, They say, oh, it's... It, it's a surprise, but it, I believe that's, that's just an assumption I make that this is not what it was. You know, it's like the people saying, oh, I got the cold because it was cold outside. And we know now, especially Corona, this is not true. You don't get the cold because it's cold to get it because there's a virus. So can, can believe things and express it in some things in some way, but it's not true. Now, the surprise thing, of course, I can let my pants down and that's a surprise. So the fact that it's a surprise is not a distinguishing characteristic of magic. However, it's not wrong to say that surprise, but the surprise must be qualified in my opinion by at least three things. First, then, so it's, it has to be a surreal surprise. Let's take Joss's example of the cups and balls or they get the fruit that come out so it is a surprise, but it's absolutely surreal because you wouldn't expect them to be fruits or, or even, you know, in Gali Gali, if you get Gali Gali on YouTube and if, you know, he, he had a little uh, chicken, you know, that, that, that's even more absurd. So the surprise has to be surreal and absurd. So very important, it has to have no explanation because once you have the surprise, you see the lemon and you react normally with a, with a laugh or with a, some, oh, you know, whichever way, you know, depending on culture and social status and, and company, the reactions are more different. That's, that will be a subject of its own, how people react and express their, their reaction. So it has to have no explanation, which means it has to be impossible. So by being the surprise has to be surreal and impossible. And then I think uh, then it can be qualified as, 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 uh, as magical, as a, uh, and in this sense, uh, I would agree with the surprise thing, but uh, and, and that that's what they uh, remember most or like most about magic. Yeah, so that will be my comment about the surprise. Uh, else about uh, the the scientific research as such, or specific experiments having uh, an impact in the performance of a technique, an effect, a presentation. Mm. I, I couldn't say that because I'm not reading so many or actually not many of your very specialized papers. Now I did take the time to read your, uh, that Gustav and Alice did, the apparent action causation, using a magician forcing technique to investigate our illusory sense of agency over the outcome of our choices which is 14 pages long. And uh, some of it I understood, some of it I don't. Um, but at the end, I thought 
well, what I ask you, tell me something in this paper that would improve or change the way I execute the crisscross force or anyone executes the crisscross force. Uh, and and I, th I think there, there is nothing that would influence the handling or the text or yeah, maybe the timing, because you say that that was interesting to say that that after you cross the thing, you don't need a, a long period of time. You know, I don't agree with the result that you do it immediately. That uh, yeah, as a as a as a performing also it it wouldn't fulfill with a dramatic the dramatic construction of a trick. You know, so. It, it's good. The trick has three construction level is a technical construction, the dramatic construction, and a psychological construction. So with the technical and the psychological construction, maybe it, 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 it's okay, but with the dramatic, it doesn't because it wouldn't give any, any meaning. But if you if you like, I will show how is the light here? Because we are now we are going here. So uh, by magic I made uh, I made uh, an hour come back to the so let, let me show, I mean, is this in, interesting to you to see how I, as a magician, as a performer, would look at the same technique, which is the crisscross force, for the same reason than you do, to better understand it, but above all, to find something which makes it more uh, convincing, more elegant, its interior and exterior, exterior structure. So is that interesting if I make a comment on that? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, is everybody as familiar with a crisscross force is? I, because I'm not so sure we have 72 people watching. Every, everybody's familiar with that. So just in case there are two or three, there, to force mean to, to have a, 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 make a spectator take a card you want because afterwards you will relieve it reveal it in a specific way. There are different reasons you want to force a card, but that's for the moment, it's of no interest. Now, so let's assume it's the king of hearts and, uh, and, the, and the spectator is asked to cut and then the, the deck is crossed or traditional in the old books, it's a real cross. Of course, that's not necessary, it can be more casual. And then you ask the person to take the card they cut to and it's the force card, okay? So that's a technique. Now, first thing when I, John Rockabaum wrote, um, and he, I think it's only an ebook. It's about the crisscross force, it's about 40 pages. It's just an anthology, really. His is an anthology. He brought together like um, 15 methods of doing the, the crisscross force with, with subtleties. So that made me rethink. And I said, uh, first of all, the first problem of the crisscross force is uh, why cut? A cut really doesn't have any meaning unless it is embedded into the shuffling gestalt. You know, it's, it, the, the shuffle has, has, a, has a gestalt, like a, a, a whole sentence. It's an action, uh, a, set, a sequence of actions which has a superordinate meaning. And that is when you shuffle, you shuffle, and then you cut. That comes from uh, card games. And normally someone else cuts. And why do you cut? Because you assume that you cannot trust the, sh the person who shuffles and therefore you do, you, do, you do a cut to upset the order that the person who shuffles could have obtained by trickery, okay? That, that, was, that is the genesis, let's say, of the cut. And so this came together with another thing I had come, I have concluded already uh, quite a while ago and which I've never found uh, formulated like that in the literature. It is before you do a force, regardless of which one it is, shuffle the deck. Because if I tell you, take a card, Alice, and you tell, and I try to, to recreate the emotion as if you were here. You're here, I said, take a card. Now I do the same thing and I say, okay, Alice, let, let's, there's a pack of 52 cards. Let's uh, shuffle the cards. Let's cut the cards. And I ask you to take a card. Now, don't you feel more comfortable with that second situation simply because uh, the deck has been shuffled? Uh, I think, well, it's my assumption, yeah, that's a make, so we shuffle, we force the king of hearts. So that's the first thing, and I say, okay, before every shuffle, if at all possible, 
have the spectator or yourself shuffle the deck. Now, as a consequence, and of course, the shuffle uh, has to be has to be anchored in the spectator's memory, and that's where I do the, the Tamaris calls this the the three steps of the Nemocene in his uh, in in his book the the um, magic rainbow the magic rainbow, but it's much it's much older. Uh, Confucius he says, "Tell me, and I forget. Show me, and I remember." involve me and I learn. Therefore, uh, it's become one of the memory strategies I'm using. And well, I, it's not that I want to plug my book, but this is my latest book. It's just out and of course sharing secrets. And it's called, the subtitle is the 52 most important and practical strategies in magic. And that's where I've tried to pinpoint 52 of the most important essentially psychological or strategic principles that are used in deception of magic you know and and this is one so the memory which i call it in that I have a chapter they will call it memory editing you know so here here we're going to anchor the shuffle the first thing is i say okay let's shuffle the card remember this is on top so let's shuffle them like they do uh, in in africa africa or in the asian countries and shuffle them like like they do in uh, in Europe, or like they do in uh, in America, in the USA, they do it with like this. And of course, and now I have mentioned it, so I said it. I've done it. I've shown it in three 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 levels already. There are three three different shuffles. And now I will involve them. There's an idea by Paul Curry and Tamaris came to. It. I said, let's do it like the Chinese. The Chinese use Chinese sticks. So use your two fingers. So of course you, you will be sitting here and you will be using your two fingers to push the cards in. So now I can, I can sum this up, which is, is another uh, theoretical concept, you know, make them brief or remember. So, so you shuffle, it doesn't matter how you shuffle the cards, whether like in Europe or like in Africa or like the Americans, you always have to, and I finish this, the sentence, I don't finish the sentence, so I call it uh, the, the midwife theory. You have, you don't convince them. You help them convince themselves. So they will answer, cut the cards. And I say, correct. Always cut the cards. Now this cut, right? This cut that comes, which is really what normally is used for the for the Chris cut, that has a, a, a logical and meaningful continuation. So he cuts that, and I will now just cross the cut. Well, I do this in a, in a mer more or less, um, I call this morphological way, which means I prepare the position, I call this a morphological position. I prepare the position so it is easier to execute or to continue the next step, which is necessary in the construction or on the timeline of this uh, procedure, right? So that's why I put it like that. So now, I agree that the pause here, which is a, I call is a positive insertion as opposed to a negative insertion. Uh, the positive insertion helps the negative insertion detracts. It's a, another little talk we won't give here. But now I go back and I briefly say, so you shot the cards were shuffled and you cut. So now I repeat in body language, in the air, I pantomime it. So I pantomime the shuffles, which is true. I repeat it verbally, which is also true. And uh, semantically it's true because it's true that he did cut, but he did not cut like that. However, since he agreed or he had to agree the spectator on the both statements that went before, the statement I'm doing now and supporting in pantomime, you know, recreates, I mean, this reality. So what you're really doing, you're going back on the timeline and you are changing an inf a piece of information which he already put in his ultra short time memory. You know? so, so I do this. And now comes the thing I only found about two years ago or three years ago. I say, so please take the packet you cut off. And I do this gesture. So the spectator, you imagine there's, a spectator, there's no spectator here. So imagine the spectator now 
has to lift that off. And I say, and with your other finger, take the card which you cut to, you know, look at it. And of course, it's a force card. And now it depends how the effect uh, is going to be. Now, let's assume I just wanted to force the card because I want to know it or because I will reveal it later. Now I say, and replace it, square the pack, and he will replace that. So in that moment, you know, he will, he, I think this is a major improvement in, in, in this force. He will really believe in his new reality, which is going to put in his short time and then hopeful in his long-term memory, and which is going to tell to the others, his memory is the cards were shuffled. I cut off, I took a card, I put it back, and then I replace it. And I will, I will close that by saying, and now shuffle the cards once again. Now by saying shuffle the cards once again and repeating the gesture and maybe making a gag and saying, you could do it, of course, like they do it in Africa or the USA or something like that, you know. Uh, uh, I think that this way of approaching uh, a slight, or, or, or of course you can approach a whole effect or a part of it, the pres its presentation or whatever. That is, well, is that scientific? Um, yes, in a way, because of course I'm, I'm, I'm doing what you do in sciences. Uh, first, I identify a problem. Uh, I, and then, of course, I identify a problem by asking a question. And then I, I think through different methods, which you would call make experiments, but uh, yeah, I also do experiments, either by trying it different times in different ways, or by just thinking myself through it. You know, after 48 years of experience, I can do that without even having to try. In certain, most cases, I can get to an almost perfect result. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a way of showing how the work that, ha that can be done in experimental science and the work that is done in practical uh, magic by a performing by a performer um, has similarities, but also uh, fundamental differences. Is that thank of you. any help? I don't know. I'm, yes, it you, was. Thank you, you so much. Made, for that. I can okay. just talk about the, my reality and I, uh, how I have been approaching and how I study the subject. And you have to find your way if this ha somehow matches your way you are looking at, at, at the subject we are both looking at. You know. Thank you so much, Roberto. I'm just uh, have to say, Josh has to leave. I know that you have to run away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thanks for thank letting me speak. And um, it's been a pleasure to talk with all of you about this. And I'm always available by email if you have any other questions or, or areas of interest. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye bye, Josh. So, thank you, Roberto. You just gave me 10 different uh, ideas for new experiments to test out your principles. <laughs> it was nice. Well, that's a so, good thing. And again, thank you so much, Gustav, Andy, and Roberto, and to all our attendees. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.